Hello, my name is Colin Goldberg, and uh, welcome to the Tech Freshness Salon. Um, <laughs> this uh, particular salon is uh, on the topic of art and physics, and we have a guest moderator today, um, Cynthia Di Donato. Uh, I'm just going to ask that if you are not um, sharing, um, please uh, mute your microphone. Um, and um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Cynthia. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Uh, I'm Cynthia Di Donato, as Colin already mentioned. And um, can you see my presentation? Yep. Okay, let's see if I can get it out there. Um, Okay, I have a very strong interest in art and physics, although I'm certainly a, lay, a layman when it comes to the subject. Some of my own work deals with this interest. And as you can see here in front of you is a book that pretty much inspired this um, salon. And uh, as you can see, the title talks about parallel visions in space, time, and light. Much of the commentary in this presentation is from uh, Schlein's book, so I'll make that mention of that. Physics is singled out because all other hard sciences are anchored to this rock. Uh, Schlein tells us revolutionary art and visionary physics are both investigations into the nature of reality. Revolutionary art in all times has served this function of preparing the future. He proposes that radical innovations of art embody pre-verbal stages of the new concepts that will eventually change a civilization. Space, time, and light were the three constructs revised by Einstein in his 1905 special theory of relativity. And I'm gonna show you a few examples that predate scientific advances according to Schlein. Uh, the first is the Italian painter Giotto, who infused space into art and redefined the artist's framework of time. This is an example of artistic imagination expressed much before Einstein's theory of relativity was even published. Before Einstein made his discovery that light is the quintessence of the universe, Claude Monet announced the real subject of every painting is light. Picasso's cubist work, Ma Jolie, in 1911, illustrates that solid, apprehensible reality located in space and fixed time crumbled. Einstein's formula and a cubist painting are alike in that all frames of reference are relative to one another. Moving on, uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal uh, drew Puncurgy cell of the human cerebellum in 1899. He's known as the father of modern neuroscience. The artist Cajal was the first to suggest that individual cells structure the brain. And in 1890, created detailed drawings to illustrate his microscope aided findings. Now to more contemporary artists. At the Smithsonian Hirshhorn Museum, and Sculpture Garden, Mexican-Canadian artist Lozano Hemmer exhibited in 2018 and 19. His interactive artwork pulse filled the museum's entire second floor galleries with evocative, immersive environments that use heart rate sensors to create kinetic and audiovisual experiences from the visit visitor's own biometric data. Pamela Fachimo Sundstrom is an artist driven by fascination with ancient mythology and scientific theories. Her works on paper and wood make use of a range of different media. Born in Botswana and having lived in Southeast Asia and in the United States, she explores the concept of identity within temporal, geographic, and cultural contexts. Liz Halloran, born in Chicago, Illinois, and grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. In this haunting photographic series, Dark Skate, 
Each work is a self-portrait of the artist who attaches a light to her body and skateboards in the dark. The line of movement is recorded and the resulting images are each a trajectory of the artist's movement over time. The work blurs the boundaries of photography and become drawings as well as records of performances as the lines of light behave as physical objects or break apart into flurries of abstraction. This series pays homage to her youth as a female skateboarder and surfer and how it has merged with her own understanding and study of astrophysics. Takeaways. One, art can predate scientific advances. Two, what was only imagined can become real. And three, art and science can be a source of artistic expression, which you will learn about from our speakers shortly. I want to welcome our three speakers tonight. And I would like to introduce them. Our first speaker, and let me stop sharing before I introduce. Our first speaker is, uh, I should say our first uh, three speakers uh, were in the Southampton Art Center show, Texpressionism, Digital and Beyond, uh, which occurred uh, early summer. The first is Steve Miller. Steve Miller has been working with art, science, and technology since 1980. He has collaborated with the 2003 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, Rod McKinnon, in a project about human protein. He worked at Brookhaven National Labs and at CERN in Geneva, where he lectured to the theory group. His project, entitled Health of the Planet, has been published as two monographs, Radiographic and Surf Skate, published by Glitterati Edition. His third book, Surfing the Cosmos, completes this trilogy. Surfing the Cosmos is about high energy physics at CERN and the favela in Rio that will be released this fall, 2022, with a forward by Neil deGrasse Tyson. He posts daily on Instagram at stevemiller.com and at Twitter at stevemillerart. The floor is yours, Steve. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. Thanks for the warm welcome. And yes, there is a book. Um, this is the first copy. I guess I got to, my screen is muted. So we'll, let me see if I can just change that. Um, there we go. That's, that's the book. And it is uh, on a boat coming from China. So this is the one one advanced copy that I have. Um, so let me do the screen share and get us up to speed. So, you know, Surfing the Cosmos, as you mentioned, is the uh, third part of a uh, of a trilogy about energy and the environment. And how I got here was uh, being invited to the uh, Large Hadron Collider that was at um, Brookhaven National Labs in Long Island, and I was invited to work there, and, and I did a project. And at that time, the most, you know, advanced idea of, of physics that they were looking at particles and trying to figure out the nature of, of, of what physical reality was at Big Bang. And what they did was collide protons together at the speed of light inside protons we know there are quarks and gluons and when if you collide these things at the right angle and the right speed and high enough intensity you have a plasma state called quark gluon plasma and once i got there i realized that there was something going on um in cern switzerland so they figured out the plasma state of matter and then they had something called the standard model uh, which includes all of the um elementary particles of the universe, you know, quarks, gluons, um, leptons, muons, um, you know, all the all the standard particles. And they were they're trying to figure out a way that all of these forces could be unified in a standard model. So that's electromagnetism, radiation, the strong force, and gravity. And gravity is not as significant in the quantum level. So they were thinking if there is a unified theory, is there a particle 
that unifies this all. And they thought the big challenge was unifying Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism with radiation, which was the degradation of the beta particle. And they, they thought that there was this, Peter Higgs and a bunch of other scientists in the 60s, theor, theor, they theorized that there was a particle that gave all other particles mass, a mechanism for which mass is, is um, uh, presented to particles. And, and they came up with a particle, the Higgs boson. So when I was at uh, Brookhaven, it made me realize that there was this um, next thing to do. And why was I interested? Because I always thought that art was working in the visual language of its time. And Cynthia showed that that um, Giotto painting and, and the big revelation of the Giotto painting was the one point perspective, mathematics giving per, the first kind of perspective after the flatness of Byzantine art. So I, I always thought that that art was made in this visual language of its culture. And to me, techn you know, high energy physics and science and, you know, learning about this new particle, which I had no idea what it was, the Higgs boson is, um, it got me excited to think that okay i've been to brookhaven now i gotta go to cern and and i spent time at cern and the result of that time is this book called uh surfing the cosmos and um neil wrote a really interesting essay he's uh as some of you know he's an astrophysicist he does the program nova he's the head of the hayden planetarium and he gave a great essay to kind of tie this all together and then the other person that I wanted to write was someone named Arthur I. Miller, who we talked about. And again, you showed the Einstein and the Picasso, Majo Lee, earlier Cynthia. And he wrote a book called um, Einstein Picasso, kind of putting together just something like you just did, which was innovations in art and innovations in science and how they might be connected. And um, what was interesting for his essay that he wrote is he's talking about aesthetics and many artists, this came out of a discussion at SVA when I first met Arthur, artists were arguing at SVA, some artists, that aesthetics was in the realm of, of you know, fine art and visual culture. And of course, if you talk to a mathematician, their idea of aesthetics would be a perfect formula. So this is a really interesting essay that he wrote um, about how perfect formula and uh, and what this perfect formula means. And if it's a formula is beautiful enough, then uh, that means it's valid. So that's an essay that's coming up. And so the, the book, the low energy story about energy is what's going on in the favelas in Brazil. And it's this, you know, massive land clearing and the need, this sort of like chaotic need for resources. And what I found in Brazil was this very very un unruly unlawful place and interesting stories you have to get permission from the drug dealers to go in and to get into CERN I had to get some security clearance so it's kind of ironic that in both of these places you have to get some security clearance to get in so I saw in these wires the story of human activity and I used these wire uh, images as sort of sources of paintings that represent a kind of activity that it is itself a kind of energy and visual drawing. So I'm going to go way forward now and flip through and get us to the CERN part of this discussion. And what happened um, in the favela is that I'd also had this experience in CERN where I'd spent a couple of weeks over a period of two years and I had this incredibly stimulating interaction with the the scientists, and they they gave me, you know, their perspective on what they're doing. One just short story is when I got there, I was able to have lunch with these guys, lunch and dinner actually for a week with the leading particle physicists in the world, and and I said, okay, tell me what you're doing. Pretend I'm a Labrador retriever, and explain to me. Uh, what's going on at CERN. And he said, well, pretend, this is the collider, by the way, and I'll finish the story. This is 30 stories underground. You can see the guy in the background and the top tier to give you an idea of the scale of this thing. So this detector is actually uh, eight stories tall, and you can see 
in the center of the screen, horizontal blue line. And just below, above that blue line is actually the proton beam line. So when they, when the, when the detector is up and running, the left side of the image and the right side of the image come together and, and they become tight and they collide those protons right in the center of that, of that space. And those panels there actually measure the energy going through in every direction right at the speed of light. And they're able to measure the collisions, the energy that produces the collision. And to get back to Einstein, we know E equals MC squared, E energy equals mass, right? Forget about for this discussion that there's, a, a, you know, times the speed of light squared, but there's equivalency between energy and mass. So if you can measure the energy of a collision, you can assign it a mass. So when they thought that they could find this particle, the Higgs boson, they, they figured that if they could measure all the different interactions took place, all the collisions and sort them out, which is billions of collisions, they would find patterns and a certain consistent to a collision, which would be the mass of a new particle. And that's what happened uh, at CERN. So, okay, I'm having, you know, lunch with these guys. This is the beam line right here. And I go, okay, he said, one side said, pretend that the universe is packed snow and you're a photon. And you're gliding across the snow, you're on cross country skis, and the field of snow, you're not interacting with that field of snow, you're gliding across that field, not interacting with it. Take your skis off and put on snowshoes. Now you're sinking into the field. So, as a result of having the snowshoes, you now have more mass in relationship to the field. Take the snowshoes off. Uh, now you're really sinking deeply, you're moving slowly, and in relationship to that field of snow, you have more mass. So that's the kind of um, uh, this sort of uh, area of potential that takes place that gives these other particles uh, their mass. You have a field of potential where, where things take place and that assigns mass to other particles. It's a mechanism for assigning mass. And he said, okay, so what we do is we take a stick of dynamite, we throw it into the snow field, and we try to find a snowflake. So that, that's kind of what got me there. But I was very interested in the visual culture of CERN and how things looked and taking some of these source imagery and combining them with some of the chalkboards at CERN and coming up with a series of images as I had done with the favela earlier. And the idea was to get this conversation about energy and understanding that it's um, operating on a lot of different levels and the low level in the favela is that you know we're 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 raping the earth and we're clearing the earth to have this energy and it's unlikely that energy you know human behavior is going to change any and there's this sort of general sustain not in this room but for science and some aspects of culture and i wanted to really make the idea that this stuff is accessible and that science is really gonna, if anything can happen that's positive, it might come through science. This is actually a real photo of, of one of the uh, scientists at CERN. It's his desk and it's crazy. And these are cables that are connecting all the experiments. So all of those panels that you saw early on uh, get connected to banks of computers and, and they're able to look at the collisions take place and analyze and decide whether they found the boson or not. Of course, who doesn't like a chalkboard? And the the, the visual graphics at CERN really remind me of those spaghetti wires that we saw in the favela in Rio. So I thought there was this very interesting discussion between high energy physics and, and the sort of need for survival and human resources. This is actually um, an MRI of my brain, of all the blood vessels in my brain. And there was a lot of humor in these chalkboards, like you can see a battle ax in the lower left-hand corner, like a medieval ax and a bottle of wine. And I just really started thinking about, these are great images. And to get them out into the world, I had this idea that I'd, that I'd done earlier with the radiographic, the first book in the series, book number one, is to figure out a way to get this information out into the world. And I thought surfing and skating was a way to bring these out in a different kind of context other than fine art. And that's also 
the reason for doing the book is to make this work accessible, make it something that sparks curiosity and brings in another discussion about what's the nature of science and, and can we get interested in it. This is a, a well-known chalkboard, which I photographed when I was there. And I would use these and take the chalkboard, the previous chalkboard image, lay it on top of this crazy image of the wires from the favela to kind of put this discussion in one place. So a lot of the book is about source imagery and where it comes from. So this, if you looked at this long enough, you'd find the part of the of this. There's an infinity symbol on the left side of the chalkboard. And this is one section of that particular painting. I just went crazy with the expressive possibilities that came through science. I love the kind of art historical connection to expression and, and that's sort of how the text expressionist thing was was part of the discussion. And getting these images to lots of different ways. This is a, a rug company in Nepal that commissioned me to uh, make a rug. And this is one of the chalkboards that I took a section of. I altered it a little bit for clarity's sake. Uh, and here it is as actually a finished product. So it's, it's you know, on the left, you have now, best, future, things that just evoke language and visual thoughts to get you connected and then get you around the curiosity of science. So you mentioned earlier, Rob McKinnon, Cynthia, he did a particle on human protein. He understood how ions move across cell membranes. So that's the electricity in your body. So that white helix structure below, is one of his models of human protein with the wires of the favela and this chalkboard that you're seeing right here, silk screen on top in yellow. And for me, this painting and body is really the story of electricity of the body as it's used and as it's uh, considered to look at the universe deeper in theoretical physics. And uh, the person I originally asked to write for the book is Tom Stoppard, who's this gentleman here, he's a playwright. Uh, in England, Sir Tom Stoppard, he loves physics, and I, his children are friends of mine, and he posed, he loves my stuff, they gave him my fashion work as a present, which you're seeing, so here he is modeling that chalkboard you saw earlier that's now put into sustainable Mongolian cashmere, and then I started make, making masks from this stuff later on, and there's lots of interesting connections between art history and science at CERN, and I love these crazy posters that they have around CERN and, and the language like neutrino town meeting, right? It's, and um, we talked about the standard model earlier, um, hard and soft QCD flavor, theory and PDFs, the standard model, this kind of language system really kind of in, inspired me. And then this is part of the fashion. I got, I got a minute left, Cynthia? Yes. Yeah, okay, I can wrap it up. So this is sort of the fashion component, to get this stuff out into the world. Source image that I made in, uh, from one of these posters and having it as sustainable as really that you could wear. And again, these references to art history and you've got the Velasquez painting Las Meninas with dif diffraction and vector mesons, electroweak physics. So these are like poems to me this is imagery, source imagery. This is what it's like down 30 stories uh, below. And uh, again, this version of wires, which is kind of neat and tidy, as opposed to the stuff that's earlier in the book. You see the beam line here on the left, magnets to suspend the beam. So it doesn't touch and it, it can be in a frictionless environment. And uh, the two beam lines in yellow, and then these, uh, Areas on the left, they, they can contain liquid nitrogen, liquid helium. So this is just the environment at, at CERN that I found really inspiring. And these sort of piranhas from the Amazon River in the control room at one of the major detectors. And um, again, these are like, like little uh, poems and haikus for me. So the, uh, the book is called Surfing the Cosmos, and it'll come out in uh, in a few weeks. It's on a trip from China, and thank you for uh, letting me uh, talk about it. Thank you, Steve. I'm jealous that you got to be at CERN and uh, learn so much there and incorporate in your art. Our second speaker tonight is Paul Miller, A.K. 
aka DJ Spooky. He was an artist in residence at Yale University for the Collaborative Arts and Media. He's exploring the intersection of art, science, and technology. He's working with a collective formerly based out of MIT's Media Lab, Art Matter Robotics Labs, to generate paintings based on a series of equations that form the foundations of modern quantum physics and translating the material into multiple transdisciplinary art initiatives. Welcome, Paul. Just, yeah, so just, just making sure, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, thumbs up, okay. So what a treat. First and foremost, uh, Steve, it's a pleasure to see you, uh, various folks, Colin, everybody. Um, I'm at Yale for the next year uh, and some change, kind of just dealing with, uh, they have a new program and a new initiative here uh, called uh, the Center for Collaborative Arts and Media. So um, I'm very inspired. In fact, um, the introduction, and you, you guys showed a friend of mine's book, regretfully, Leonard Schlein was an old friend of mine. So um, he passed away several years ago. Wow. Um, and his daughter, uh, Tiffany Schlein, is married to another friend of mine, Ken Goldberg, who's at Berkeley. Um, they have the Berkeley Robotics Lab at Berkeley University. So, um, it, you know, it's kind of, that was really beautiful and very heartwarming to see his book. Um, I read that when I was a kid. So, yeah, that's a, it's a good way to start the, the discussion. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, here we are in 2022, and we're in the era where misinformation and this, its intersection with data aesthetics and its intersection with how we think about the politics of perception, all go back to what I view as kinds of issues around how uh, science and perception intersect. Now, the pandemic, if it showed us one thing at all, it's that science is the great leveler on one hand, but the field of how we perceive what's going on with science and how it shapes and molds the civic discourse is radically, um, been just completely shattered by, and devastated by everything from social media to this kind of notion of the sort of right wing uh, filter bubble that has created uh, this notion of where we doubt reality itself, which is actually quite interesting because it's you would think that's a project that philosophers like Jean Baudrillard or Deleuze and Guattari, um, two of my favorites, or three of my favorites, sorry, would have kind of thought about from the viewpoint of how things from, uh, there's a very famous uh, series of films and essays called um, Society of the Spectacle uh, that came out in the 1960s and so on. So what does that have to do with uh, science and physics? Well, one could argue that physics is the nature's relationship to how human beings can perceive things with math. So from my point of view, um, art is kind of a situation of pattern recognition. And I'm very intrigued by that. So I wanna begin by showing you guys a couple of things um, from the viewpoint of just kind of giving you a sense of how art and science in my work kind of intersect. So um, this is uh, two of my favorite gentlemen. Uh, they were backstage. Uh, this is Einstein and the uh, Indian and uh, Bang Bengali poet, Rabindranath Tagore. Um, they met backstage at the Nobel Prize Awards. And amusingly enough, Einstein, when he was nervous and he couldn't finish an equation, he would begin playing violin. He was actually quite a talented violinist. And he said his best ideas and his best equations came from when he um, engaged with music. And he was a big fan of stuff like Bach's Goldberg variations and so on. Now, another book that I personally actually would love to have seen earlier in tandem with Leonard Schlein's book, Art and Physics, is Douglas Hofstetter's book, Godel Escher Bach. Now, to me at least, when you start thinking about the issues of art in this era of information overload, we have to really question where art comes from. Now, if I told you in a funny way, like, okay, Da Vinci, Machiavelli, and um, you know, a couple other folks walk into a bar in the middle of the Renaissance. Um, so, you know, Galileo and Da Vinci and, and uh, all right, let's say Galileo, Da Vinci, and above all Machiavelli, those three guys are sponsored by the Medici. And the Medici at a certain time were really incredibly um, important catalyzer for thinking about the rise of humanism. And one could argue the Renaissance kind of created this moment where science, like what they called natural philosophy, and above all the aesthetics of how the human mind worked in nature became front and center in the European mind. Meanwhile, other parts of the world, whether you were in China, 
sub-Saharan Africa, and above all the Islamic world, um, people were kind of moving to this notion of how we think about nature and math as not separate, but deeply fundamental components of how we think about the notion of how human beings engage multiple dimensions, multiple senses of time, and above all, how we think about this notion of a seamless field of perception that kind of links how we think about the human being in nature. Now, I'm a big fan of someone uh, by the name of Edwin Abbott who wrote this book called Flatlands. And amusingly enough, if you haven't read Flatlands, it's a, he calls it a romance of many dimensions. And one of the things that really struck me when I was preparing for this conversation was I wanted to get people to think not just about the arts um, as separate from science, but as science as determining how the fundamental field of perception can work. So uh, when Steve was showing his brain, for example, um, one of the things that struck me is that how we are evolving in this era of information overload is that we are becoming creatures of pattern recognition. Now, for the text expression exhibition um, that uh, Colin curated, I put together a painting using a series of equations coming out of both Schrodinger and Heisenberg um, in their engagements with later developments, which would now be called quantum entanglement. Um, from my perspective, the arts are always a kind of conversation with the potential of what faces us at the edge of the imagination. When I say the potential, imagine if you were back in the Middle Ages and you didn't know that, okay, a storm front is basically a low pressure zone floating over your city. You would think the gods have spoken, maybe Zeus is throwing some lightning bolts at you. Um, or if you didn't have a correct map, you would think, okay, the world ends at this certain point and the rest is just, there be dragons. You know, that was a very famous, if you ever see early medieval maps, the world would just end and they would say, here be dragons, just, just don't even bother. But as we move further into this notion of the Anthropocene era, we can easily see that knowledge is a gateway. It's a portal that we move through and that arts helps pave that path. So the painting that I generated, uh, this is one of the first editions. I'm gonna be working on the series at Yale over the next two years. So regretfully, I don't have a lot of the body of work yet because literally the residency started just a couple of weeks ago. So. This is one of the first pieces. Um, I'm generally fascinated with this notion of the legible landscape, how we think about the acoustics of space and time and how acoustics itself is one kind of metaphor that human beings use to navigate. So for example, the core of the COVID virus, for example, comes out of the displacement of bats from their biome. Bats use sonar and above all, the sonar allows them to navigate using incredibly powerful acoustic techniques. Now, amusingly enough, the reason I'm showing you a painting and then talking about bats is that the sonar that the bats use is one of the most complex signals in nature. They're able to encapsulate a tremendous amount of information into the way they, they use that to bounce their sound off of their environment around them. Guess what else? Whales do a similar thing. Uh, when you see or hear a whale, uh, usually they have this kind of keening sound. That's what you call an acoustic hologram. Now, whales, depending on which species, some of them have the largest brains in the world, and they have the, some of the most sensitive ears in the world. And they've been actually a series of studies showing that the acoustic signals of the whales are being destroyed by humans because we're, as usual, disrupting and de destroying their biome because of um, the way that shipping and other kinds of acoustic phenomena are happening in the ocean. Now, again, what does this have to do with the painting? Let me, let me explain. The painting you're seeing um, is embedded with different equations looking at complexity theory, information theory, and some of the foundations for what you call quantum entanglement. Now, the, this is part of a series, and this is one of what I call sort of 1.0, um, and I didn't make it by hand. What I ended up doing was working with a robotics lab, and the robots are based on this idea of, of sort of drawing equations, and I'm fascinated with that. Normally, you could say, that, okay, well, that's plotting, P-L-O-T-T-I-N-G, um, and that's okay, but math, nature, and sound are truly incredibly complex phenomena, and this is the studio that I'm working out of, hopefully you can see that. So what I do is I send a series of um, mathematical uh, formulas and so on to the robot behind me, and the robot then generates pattern permutations based on kind of snapshots of where the equations would be. Um, so when you start to think about math, it's simply a process. And one could argue that when we think about quantum physics, when we think about the fundamentals of physics, it's human beings trying to map our own perspective into the natural world. So for example, 
one could argue, do we discover an equation or do we somehow create a perception of what's already existing in nature? And that's the, these are issues that both Plato and Aristotle grappled with in Pythagoras early on in Greek philosophy. But if you fast forward to the 21st century, one of the things that really fascinates me is how we're developing new senses of literacy as we move into a world dominated by information theory. So what we are seeing right now is kind of grappling with the physics of presence. And that's kind of my nickname for this stuff right now. Uh, when you think about well, here we are on Zoom, every color, every pixel is being calculated in real time and being computed using various microchips in our devices and then distributed over a massive internet. Um, this is all stuff that would have become part. So let me explain a little more because I think it's really important. Um, so in my work, I do concerts and events that are essentially part of how I think about the role of the composer and evolution in the 21st century, information aesthetics, sound aesthetics. Um, many of my concerts and events have been in all sorts of contexts. Um, so let me just show you a couple of things that will give you a sense of uh, context. Um, a little while ago, I had a concert at the Acropolis and we got the Greek government to uh, let me project uh, D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation on the ruins of the Herod Atticus Theater. And if you can see quickly behind me, I'll pinch and zoom. Those are massive speakers that we got the government to let me put throughout the ruins of the, the Herod Atticus Theater at the base of the Acropolis. Now, intriguing enough, ancient Greek architecture was quite mathematical and they tried as much as possible to think of this idea of the tuning of the universe. And that's again, where you have Pythagoras, Heraclitus and their legacy in architecture and symmetry. Now, how does that again, go back to the paintings I was showing you? Well, when you start to think about the acoustic space that would have been developed thousands of years ago, what you're seeing here is an amplification device. You would be in the theater and they had discovered that the rings of those theaters were able to amplify the acoustic waveforms of the actors' voices, and thus you have the origins of modern theater. But you also have, if you look at any movie theater's logo, they actually have the similar thing, like oh, most of movie theaters have this little semicircle. And I'm fascinated with how this notion of ancient forms of uh, engaging with math and architecture would then imbue our modern contemporary sensibility. So if you go back in time to 1915, this is an infamous photograph of sound generating devices. Um, this is the gentleman on the left with the mustache is Luigi Russolo. He um, basically helped give us a sense of noise and chaos in modern sensibilities. He was what they call an Italian futurist. And the concerts that he would throw were essentially coming out of these, what you call noise generators, in tono rumore, if you speak Italian. Now, the science, the acoustic science actually is really fascinating because at that time, this was a radical avant-garde gesture. And what ended up happening, with, this is a con generally considered to be the first sound system. So in 1915, when he had this, um, he wrote a book called The Art of Noise, again, Arte di Romore. But his concerts would be people cranking these machines and generating crazy noise because he wanted to simulate the acoustic dimensions of an invisible city. Now, what's fascinating is, is that this was highly controversial. Um, audiences would riot. People would throw bottles at them. You know, it's this kind of original punk rock here. And um, they said, where's the band? You know, and he's like, the band is the invisible waveforms coming out of these speakers. Now, if you fast forward to 2022, guess what? The device you're listening to, this, this discussion on, the screens around us, all of these, the main thing they are is acoustic dimension devices. Now, what's fascinating is those loudspeakers have been miniaturized, they've been distributed, they've been through almost every uh, electronic device that we use because that's how we engage them. Uh, whether you're looking at everything from Siri to Alexa on over to the voice command modules on almost any of your you know, speakers, et cetera. All of that still ties. I know, I know you have a time constraint. It's right. 616, you still have two minutes if you want it. Okay, yep, give me a second. I'm just um, tying it all together here. So the, the art of noise and physics is quite interesting because noise is one could argue one of the most complex phenomena of physics that human beings engage with every day. So thinking of noise as a complex information system, it's actually a different kind of encryption. Uh, for example, when you create a mathematical um, you know, RSA or NSA level of encryption, you're creating mathematical noise around your data so that no one else can see it unless they have a key to transcribe that. So 
I'm going back to this rush, these Italian futurists as kind of an early form of thinking about science and sound. Now, um, recently I went to Antarctica and I wrote a book uh, with Brian Green, who's a legendary uh, physicist at, at uh, Columbia. And I took a backpack and went to several of the main ice fields and ended up um, doing what I call acoustic portraits of ice. And that made me realize we had a series of concerts at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And I'm gonna wrap up in a second, but I just wanted to tie this all in. But the book really made me realize that we are creatures of pattern, but how we think about disruption of patterns is far more of the meat of what's going on right now. Uh, while I'm at Yale, I'm finishing two books. Uh, one book is about quantum physics and art, and that's gonna be with Jack Hedery. And he just did a, he just sold his company to Google. Uh, it's called Sandbox. He was the director of uh, Google's innovation lab. So we'll be kind of riffing with that here at Yale. And then um, the paintings there, we're still in development. So some of those are gonna be the robots we are evolving. We're keeping them in a warehouse near Pioneer Works in Red Hook in Brooklyn. Uh, so I'm commuting between New York and Brooklyn constantly. Um, and at the end of the residency, we'll have a, both a performance looking at quantum physics and dance. And we'll also have a series of paintings and other kinds of works. Um, now, by way of conclusion, by the way, Cynthia, this is the, one of my favorite examples of the legible landscape. What you're seeing here is the first equations that set up Google Maps. And I interviewed the gentleman who invented Google Maps. His name's Noel Gordon, and he's in my last book. Uh, Google Maps generally is considered to be um, the most used app in the world over the last several years, because I would, I would imagine almost everyone in this um, conversation uses it. But you'll see from A to B. And that reminded me of Andy Warhol, who had a book called From A to B and Back Again, The Philosophy of Andy Warhol. But imagine if you apply this to how equations and algorithms shape the modern discourse. Uh, so Warhol, Duchamp, um, some of those other earlier artists, they were still grappling with this idea of replication, copies, and this notion of originality. And for me, at least, in the era of information overload um, and in the Anthropocene era that we inhabit, science is one of the tools that I think artists have the best way to help us reimagine the idea of what the future could be. And so again, going back to that Luigi Russolo, tying it in even with what Cynthia was mentioning with Leonard Schlein at the beginning. Um, Leonard was a very dear friend of mine. And so that was very heartwarming to see his book. Um, and I know I'm on a tight time frame here. So I just want to wrap up really quickly with one last image and I'll just say thank you guys. Um, so here we are. This is America's first satellite. And intriguingly enough, it was called the Explorer. It was launched by James Van Allen. And in fact, Amazingly enough, the electromagnetic phenomenon that surrounded the planet was unknown at the time. And what's intriguing about this is that it was in response to the Soviets' launch of the Sputnik missile. I'm sorry, Sputnik satellite. Now, at that time, we still had not explored at, uh, the exterior of the planet. We'd still not explored how the phenomena of electromagnetism operated in the atmosphere. So the Van Allen belts are what allow most of our electronic devices to work. Again, physics of presence. And what was fascinating is that when they discovered these crazy radiation belts above the planet, they didn't realize that it interacts with almost all aspects of keeping the solar winds from destroying all our electrical devices. If there's a solar storm, for example, uh, the Earth's magnetic sphere helps block that. So thus our devices still work. And if there's a solar storm that was coming through them, um, no, nothing would work. Um, the electromagnetic fields would be disrupted. So long story short, what I'm fascinated with is that not only did we launch this missile with Werner von Braun, who was a former Nazi, uh, but James Van Allen, when they discovered the, these electromagnetic belts, they named it after them, they're called the Van Allen belts. But amusingly enough, this was a product of the military industrial complex competition between the Soviets and the US, capitalism, communism. Um, so here we are in the 21st century with a multipolar world where science, in fact, most of the science that we're using comes out of the legacy of World War II. And it's a, one could argue it was an information war. So Alan Turing was a mathematician whose work was basically most famously popularized by his helping crack the German Enigma device, uh, which was their encryption devices. So this still is all about physics. It's still all about the way information and aesthetics intersect with art. But I wanna kind of make a more lyrical approach. And the reason I'm wrapping up with this image of the Van Allen belts is it's kind of a cautionary tale. The first time they discovered it, um, anyone who's a historian buff, uh, or history buff, sorry, the first thing they did, they tried to nuke them, and they sent nuclear bombs into the atmosphere. Uh, it was called Operation Starfish Prime. 
But here we are uh, with the war in Ukraine, the Zaporizhna nuclear power plant, right, and uh, occupied by the Russians, for example. And we still haven't learned the lessons of Fukushima or for that matter, Nagasaki or Hiroshima. So the atomic age, the space age race, the information age, those are all things that we are as artists grappling with for all the tools that allow us to create what we do. Um, I'm gonna be exploring this over the next two years. And I just wanted to say, uh, Colin, thanks for having me. I regret that I have to, oh yeah, Hedy Lamar is also. Oh, Hedy Lamar, actually, she's generally considered, again, as a woman, she helped invent uh, Bluetooth and um, early Wi-Fi, so credit due. Um, so I just wanted to say thanks so much for having me. I regret it. I'm here at Yale and we're literally having the reception for the launch of my residency like now. So um, I got to run, but um, if anybody has, wants any um, feedback or commentary, Steve, good to see you too. Um, Great to see you, Paul. I'll, yeah, I'll be back in the Hamptons in a bit. Uh, I'm going to be doing some stuff at the church with Eric Fischel in a bit. Um, but love you guys. And seriously, man, Colin, I love this whole text expressionism thing. We need more. So thanks, you guys. And, thanks for uh, coming, Paul. You know, I want to get a copy of that book when it comes out. All right, you guys. I got to run. You all. Hope, all right. to, hope to see your work in the future. Okay. Thanks, you guys. All right. Bye. Well, another amazing discussion about physics and art. Uh, we've gone from the Higgs boson particle, the God particle that Steve Miller was talking about, and then on to quantum entanglement. Well, our third speaker is Michael Pierce Price, who earned a physics degree from Purdue University and did three years graduate work in theoretical astrophysics at the University of Toledo. He conducted research into early star formation with Bach globules. I hope I said that right, Michael. Using data from the Cerro Tololo Observatory in Chile. Michael has been published in the American Journal of Physics. He is currently working on his own long-term book project about the nature of reality and the story of the universe, using his artwork to illustrate and weave together the areas of physics, neuroscience, spirituality, and creativity. You're on, Michael. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, wow, this is a tough act to follow from, uh, from from the two previous speakers. So uh, anyway, um, this is this is obviously a topic for me that um, has been near and dear to me for a long time. Uh, I was just realizing uh, in preparation for talking that 45 years ago at this very time, um, I was uh, just a couple weeks into uh, being a graduate student at the University of Toledo, so it feels like a whole lifetime ago. <laughs> uh, never would I have thought at 22 that I would at 67 be an artist talking to a group like this. So, you know, life is life is strange and interesting. So it's uh, I, I'm, I'm really humbled to be here uh, and uh, to talk about uh, this. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see this okay? Yes. All right. So, oops. Um, so I thought I needed a, a, a cool title for my talk. So uh, the idea of black holes, Boltzmann brains, and the heat death of the universe. That's that's what I want to uh, title this, and uh, I'll get get around to what all that means for those of you uh, who might be interested. Um, so it's people have unfortunately have very very different ideas of what physics and science are all about, and um, I, I've been really happy to hear both what Steve and Paul were talking about. And um, I, I think it's it's very interesting because we as human beings have tried to make sense of this universe since we had self-conscious thoughts about survival and, and what's all around us. And we invented gods and theories and things over time to try to explain these patterns like that that Paul is talking about and what Steve was talking we're talking about. 
And as time has gone on, we've developed something that's more formalized and, and something that we now call physics. And this is something for me that was very important growing up. Um, I've always been pretty much of a loner. Uh, I, 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 I tend to keep to myself and I've always been a theoretician. Uh, I've always thought about what's the universe like. And, and so for me, I knew that um, I needed to pursue uh, science and math to for that sense of understanding of how the world works. And so that's, that's my primary reason why I went into physics. Um, and so there, the, the idea of experimentation and theorizing and revising is part and parcel with this whole methodology of what makes physics and the sciences is, and a lot of people don't understand that they think well, once we know something, it's it's like set in stone. And well, no, it's not. Uh, things change all the time. And, and that can be confounding to people who want um, certainty about how things work. Um, and, and so therefore, um, when we look at this, the language in which physics takes place is mathematics. And so to understand, to actually work through this stuff, you have to learn that language. Uh, it's the underpinnings for all of the theories and everything that happens. And as most everybody who's either bilingual, trilingual, whatever, learning a new language takes time and effort. And, and there are points of view, there are ways you structure the, your ideas and and here's what's challenging about modern physics. And especially if, if you listen to what Steve was talking about with the experiments happening at CERN and being able to understand um, what the Higgs boson is and all these other things, you're dealing with mathematical structures that are very abstract. It's not like one plus one equals two. You're dealing with set theories. You're dealing with all kinds of ideas that take time and that you have to build upon in order to learn. So you have to learn the grammar to understand how to build the sentences, uh, understand how to build the paragraphs and, and write novels, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where the math mathematics is involved with all of that. So I, I just wanted to throw three examples of mathematical discourse or structures uh, on this slide here. The first one is the field equation from Einstein's general theory of relativity. The second one is the famous Schrodinger equation for quantum mechanics. And the last one is um, a diagram, a Feynman diagram that actually shows the interactions like Steve was talking about, about proton-proton interactions that uh, the Higgs boson um, comes from. So th those are just a few examples that I just wanted to put on here to, uh, to demonstrate the mathematical discourse that physicists and others uh, speak in. And the challenge, the challenge is how do you go from understanding mathematically that in the standard model, if, if we're not talking about string theory, in the standard model that an electron is a point particle? What does that mean? You know, how do you how do you wrap your head around mathematically? You can see how that works and, and how you derive the wave equations for probabilities of where an electron might be. But how do you explain that? How do you know we, we see the, the graphical model of the electron going around the neutron and the proton in, in the standard um, symbology that we see about nuclear physics. But in reality, the electron isn't orbiting like a planet around the sun. Um, it's, it's much more complex than that um, because the nature of quantum physics is statistical and it's not deterministic in the sense of Newtonian mechanics. And 
you know, so it, it becomes very challenging to figure out how to go from math to explaining things in verbal language. And then as an artist, how do you explain these things visually, artistically? So going back from my days at the University of Toledo, this was my published paper in the American Journal of Physics dealing with the, the uh, motion of mercury around uh, the sun and the, the effect that the out outer planets have on it. Um, so this again shows a little bit of, of that uh, published paper. And then what I was working on uh, that I thought I might get my um, uh, doctorate in was early star formation. Uh, I left, I left graduate program before that happened. Um, but um, so Bach globules are these very small, dense um, areas within nebulae, which are particles that are high energy, but there are also very dark, dense uh, areas within these nebulae. And what's been theorized, and it's still an area of research, that these are potentially early star formation where the the matter starts coalescing and, co and collapsing. And through that gravitational attraction, it heats up the matter. And then if it's enough mass, it can start uh, nuclear fusion, which then starts uh, a protostar. That's what my research was in um, before I left graduate school. So my journey 40 years on since then, um, I've been very interested um, that for me, physics didn't become a career, but in retrospect, I realized it was for me a path to understand the sense of beauty in the world from a perspective that I needed in understanding the mechanics and understanding the workings of the universe. As the intervening 35, 40 years since then, um, I followed in a number of ways, a very spiritual path that connects physics to that. And I've also been very interested in psychology and neuroscience and how they all connect. And so for me, this, this circle here is, is really a representation of the various areas that um, are at the heart of who I am as a human being, but as, especially as an artist. So I did a, I did a solo show two years ago, uh, which the t-shirt I'm wearing is from called the square root of negative one. Um, and there were three truths that I, that I shared uh, as part of that exhibit. And the first one is really at the heart of my search into physics, that the world is not as it seems. And um, I'm sure Steve could attest to that as, as the things that he's discovered uh, through his work and his art, um, that the, the world in which we normally live day to day um, and the world in which we still talk about today is very Newtonian. It's, we haven't caught up to the realities that came about about a hundred years ago, uh, that the quantum world, the relativistic world hasn't really hit us in our normal way of how we see ourselves, how we see the world. We still see the world in a very discreet, divergent way. We don't see the interconnections as much as I think we should. And that if we were more conversant in some of the new physics, if we, if we taught in schools beyond just, uh, you know, the, the, the lesson about uh, Newton, but moved it forward and, and actually explained what some of these things would be, I think I think modern science wouldn't seem as magical to people today 
if, if the education system kind of caught up with what's been going on in the last hundred years. Um, the, the, other, the other truth here is I'm a heretic and, and for me that means I've always walked a very lone, lonesome path and I don't like adhering to dogma or convention. And I'm always looking how things can be done in a different way because I'd like to explore new paths, new ways. And the last, the last truth here, this sense that nothing is sacred, for me, the sense of nothing is sort of the, the Buddhist concept of nothing. Um, and that from that not being, that uh, nothingness, uh, comes everything. And that's where, for me, that's where that sacredness is. So as an artist now, I always ask myself, what am I trying to say? How do I know what I know? And how can I express it? And that's, those are really things that really direct me in my art practice. And that's why abstraction, algorithms, and surrealism are very important to my my work because I'm trying to take people out of the ordinary, the everyday, uh, to, to express that the world is so much bigger and so much more fantastic than we recognize. We see within a, a, a visible spectrum that's so much smaller than what the wide spectrum is. Um, and we, we live in a very, very controlled environment when you look at the entirety of the universe. And, and so for me, I'm trying to utilize those things that I have learned along the way from physics, from my spiritual practice, and share that and imbue that in, in my work. So uh, I just wanted to share just a couple more or just a couple examples of some artwork. Uh, this was a piece I did a, a few years ago, um, and, and this was in, in relationship to my uh, graduate work. And this doesn't look very much like uh, the one picture that I showed just a, a few slides ago, but from a mathematical, from a physics standpoint, it represents very much the inner dynamics that are happening between the interplay between light and energy and gravity and how you get these eddy currents that happen and how things coalesce. And so for me, the, the lighter area of yellow is the, the bright energy, the dark areas are the dark gravitational forces that are starting to work and, and the interplay between the two. Michael, you have a minute. Okay. Um, Deep muon is uh, directly from a uh, physics particle experimentation. And I took this into uh, some AI programs to accentuate the 3D aspect of <coughs> visuals. And then the last part here, uh, black holes, Boltzmann brains, and the heat death of the universe, which is something I wanted to talk about, but I guess I'm not gonna have a chance to. So maybe we'll have to leave that to another time. Um, cosmology is something that I've always been very interested in, in terms of how the universe started, where we're at, and where things are going. And that's what these, uh, that's what these images are uh, trying to portray. Uh, their work's in progress, uh, working with AI, uh, and I'm not happy with them all, but I just wanted to show uh, kind of what I've been working on uh, fairly recently. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, I really enjoyed seeing your art as I did Steve Miller and Paul's art. Um, it's just been uh, a special uh, occasion to learn uh, what art ticks within your world. So without further ado, I assume we shall go on to just open up the salon to discussion. I thought maybe the easiest thing to do would either be to use the hand raising function of Zoom 
or if you want to keep your hand up uh, like this so that we can uh, have a discussion. And you can find the raise hand um, icon under reactions at the bottom of your Zoom menu. I think they might have moved it within the last couple of versions. It certainly is a heady topic. Uh, I particularly enjoyed um, hearing Michael talk about getting people to become aware of physics, even as lay people, uh, because there's so much beauty there. So hopefully some of that beauty was able to come through. So feel free to, oh, we have, Vernada. You're on, Vernada. You're muted. Okay. Uh, thank you so much to all the presenters. Uh, the topic is fascinating. I do have a, a question, however, that applies to all three presenters. Um, each presenter stated the scientific involvement, uh, understanding, inspiration, and then juxtaposed it with the artistic expression corresponding to it. However, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the middle ground between those two phenomena. Is there, um, has any of the artists or have any of the artists perceived something that they could describe as activity that feel the point of involvement in physics, understanding, appreciation of physics, and, and the manifestation of the artwork, creation of the artwork. What is that middle ground like, subjectively speaking? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, I'll take a shot at it. If I don't, Michael, you can you can go for it. I mean, I, the middle ground is somewhere between what Michael was saying. Our view of the world is Newtonian, right? We know what gravity looks like. We know when an apple falls from the tree. We have our eyes that give us our perceptions of the world. And that's been the major interpretation of reality as Michael talked about. Quantum, so there's something in between quantum and this sort of Newtonian notion of visual reality that we know now and quantum, the word quantum got brought into uh, nomenclature in terms of uh, quantum mechanics, quantum physics, because what early scientists understood that when you get into the subatomic world, that the world is, you measure it through packets of energy. And those packets of energy are, are quantum. And the life of the quantum world is a little bit like surrealism. Um, there's a great quote by Richard Feynman that uh, basically the quote is nobody understands quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And you know the reason why it's so hard to understand is because it operates on probability. It operates on something called the uncertainty principle. And you have these sort of worlds that are very, very difficult to understand. And I can read the same books over and over again. There's this other phenomena that when you observe a, a, an experiment in the quantum world, just by looking at it, the energy of shining light on something changes the results of the experiment. So it's very, very difficult to really get an understanding of what this what this world is all about. So, you know, art comes through as maybe some interpretation of, 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 of between. There's also this crazy notion of, of particle wave duality right? A particle like a photon can be like a particle, can act as a wave. So when you're in this world and when Michael was also talking about where, where is a, an electron around a proton? Well, an electron around a proton, it, it, it has aspects of energy and depending on the energy emitted, the amount of energy that the electron has, it could be jumping from, you know, metaphorically right next to that particle to someplace out in the universe. So that's how crazy 
this world is that we're talking about this quantum world. So it's a world of unlimited fascination because there's no logic. You're trying to understand it. And as Michael said, we haven't caught up with this new reality. So, you know, for me as an artist, it's this, it's this way to really understand. So my book is called Surfing the Cosmos, Energy, uh, Environment and Energy. I can't remember. I actually have to look at it. Um, what is it called? Yeah, Energy and Environment, because those are the, the key features for me of reality right now. And, and art is this, if, it, if I'm answering this question, as perhaps the middle ground in which to navigate this space and may, perhaps even make it more accessible. So uh, would you say that the light shining um, upon your consciousness, theoretically speaking, from the understanding of the physics, maybe incites a uh, interaction within your consciousness or reaction within your consciousness that then um, manifests as artistic understanding and or artistic inspiration and then artistic actualization. Does that make a sense? Yeah, I, if I understand what you're saying, you know, art is, a, is an activity of intellectual, visual, um, mental excitement, right? And it can be an escape. But, you know, what I, what I learned when I went to CERN was I had the unbelievable opportunity to be with these guys at lunch and dinner almost every day. And what was happening in my brain was like fireworks, you know, like every day was like the 4th of July, Michael's nodding because he knows what this is like. Your brain is like, ex you know, exploding with excitement. And that's exactly the feeling I got as a kid when I saw my first Jackson Pollock painting at the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo, New York. I was about eight years old. I'd never seen anything of it. I saw like this, you know, these incredible splatters you know floating in the air in front of me and it happened to be on a stairway where we looked up at it when they got the painting at the albright connecting the two buildings and this was this 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 moment of incredible excitement and mystery i was excited but i didn't know what the hell it was because i never seen anything like it and i think you know if you're talking about the the mental stimulation that happens both in art philosophy science mathematics it's this you know acute moment of incredible excitement and it's really addictive as michael can tell you yeah and and i think renata if i if i get your question well well as as uh, what steve has been saying i mean as artists all of our experiences everything we've you know understood uh is part of who we are and so so because I've been able to study and learn the mathematics. I have a point of view that really, you know, I can draw upon as an artist that if I hadn't had that, it would be very different. It's like I went to see, you know, I went to the Grand Canyon about five years ago and I'd see pictures, et cetera, but being there was the magic. You know, seeing the pictures is, you know, like it, it doesn't compare or hearing other people tell me about it. And Steve being at CERN, I mean, oh my gosh, I'm so envious of him and those experiences because, you know, I've been at, you know, I've been at, uh, at Batavia in the Chicago area. And, and uh, so there, there, there is something very magical about seeing and being involved in experimentation because that's the physics equivalent of beauty of of something where you've been thinking about if this if this idea is true we should see this result and sometimes it happens other times you learn from that sometimes it's confirmed and you learn from that as well and and it's that process. And I think as artists, we go through that as well. We, we start on a path, we're learning, we're learning, we're learning, and we start to get better and we go down new paths. And, and I think that middle ground for me is the experiential element. So if you were to take string theory into your circumstance of being inspired by what you were learning in physics, okay? And it became a part of your lived 
reality um, here in that room where you are right now, okay? Yes. What would that look like? <laughs> now that's, now, now that's, I, I love that question. And that, that was part of that one slide. I said, it's like, how do I know what I know and how do I share that? That's the challenge. And that's what Steve was just talking about. We, the, the thing with mathematical knowledge is it's in that realm and you, you can go to it. You can go to a physicist and you can, you can speak that language. But then if you try to take that out of that realm and say, what does that mean conceptually, practically, artistically, you have to figure out what is that translation. The way Steve translates his understanding versus the way I translate my understanding, that's part of our uniqueness of each one of our artistic paths. I. <laughs> it's a conundrum in, in one respect. There, we've been talking about quantum mechanics and the understanding of what quantum mechanics means at the most fundamental level is still at debate a hundred years from, from when it started to really come about. I mean, do you believe in the Copenhagen theory, multi, you know, multiple world theories? I mean, there's there's a lot of ways to interpret what the mathematics says. And the mathematics is extremely accurate in the predictions, but what does it mean? And that's what we struggle with as human beings to find fundamental understanding of how we conceptualize what the math is telling us. Okay, well, I, I, <laughs> I, I thank the two of you so much. I asked the question because I seem to have uh, stumbled into a series of uh, experiences that I could explain um, possibly better if I had understanding of, of quantum physics, ah. you know. But thank you so much for your explanations for, for you both. Are we ready for uh, Lee? Had his hand up. Would you like to ask your question or make a comment? Uh, I, I love the discussion. It, it takes me back to the 1960s and early 70s <laughs> uh, when I was talking to all these people from MIT and art and technology and even some of the SIG graphic people. When I would explain to them that I was an artist and, and back in those days, if you were doing photography and painting, you had problems with the galleries. Every gallery that I worked with always said to me, Lee, we're happy to show your paintings, but uh, don't mention photography to anybody. <laughs> uh, and most of them wouldn't show any of the photography work. And then when I would explain to them about what I was trying to do with computers and photography, um, and I would go to what I would call the science people, even the Disney Imagineering people, they would say to me, if, if you can't take the time to learn computer programming and uh, understand the basics of physics, um, well, we can't help you. <laughs> In other words, go away. <laughs> so here I was. Uh, somebody who came from the painting drawing world who discovered that, that these computers could help generate uh, images I hadn't seen before. And I wanted to do something with them. And everybody kept telling me, no, you have an art degree. You don't have a science degree. You don't even have a photography degree. You're a painter. That's what they kept saying to me. And as a painter, the last thing you can do to an artist is tell them, no, you can't do that. I didn't like, it, you know. Uh, uh, so I didn't deal with them any more than I had to. Um, and when I started curating, I would bring this up 
to the people I had to answer to, my bosses, so to speak, above me. And their answer to commercial galleries that I would curate for, they would say, we can't sell that. We, can, we don't know how to explain that to anybody. How can we sell it? You know? And the colleges and universities that I would curate for, they would say, oh, I'm not sure that the, the science department or the math department will be happy about us trying to do something like that. You, you, gotta, you gotta be able to write that down in, a, in an essay or a catalog before we can even talk about that. Scared them all to death. It took until the 90s before I could convince an institution to allow me to curate an exhibit on this theme. Because everybody couldn't understand it. And, and I had a hard time explaining it. And even when I showed them the images, they would say, yeah, it's abstract. Yeah. So the only way I could approach it to talk to people about it was closer to the spiritual side of it. When I talked about Jackson Pollock and how he made paintings in the moment, then they they would listen because Jackson Pollock had been accepted <laughs> in the art world, uh, more or less. Uh, and uh, then you try to bring up uh, Kandinsky and his writings about the spiritual as it involves with abstract imagery. Okay, so then I would say, yes, and this abstract imagery is, is aided by using a computer rather than a paintbrush. Ooh, yeah, they take a step back at that point, right there. Right there scares them. Um, and it still scares them in my opinion to this very day. Um, and we have this separation that I see going on uh, between digital artists and what might be called tech expressionist artist. And I really appreciate Colin putting an emphasis on the expressions part of it, because that's the art spiritual part of it, in my opinion. Whereas the digital artist people tend to drift closer to what I would call commercial graphic arts. A lot of the early guys that I used to meet, I'm sorry, I don't remember a lot of those names, uh, they did that. They came up through that way. They made TV commercials um, and they made other promotional things using computers to promote some product. And uh, the people that were paying them, they didn't give a damn. They didn't care if you called yourself an artist or anything else. Just get the product name and image up there, however you want to get it up there. They didn't care if it came from a computer or anything else, as long as it met their commercial requirements, they were happy. And from that, I saw the digital artist group. Those guys started making artwork. But when that printer came up, the digital printer came up uh, and people realized- Hey, that Lee, um, in the interest of time, did you have a question for either of the presenters? We're gonna have to wrap this up um, <laughs> yeah, I, in a I'm, few minutes. I'm, my apologies. I have something scheduled at seven, another Zoom meeting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just want to thank everyone for coming. I'm sorry I have to jump out. Thank you, Cynthia, for hosting. And Michael, enjoyed listening to you. Thank you, Colin. Thanks for coming, Steve. Appreciate it. And um, Steve, um, th there was a question I got. Um, when your book does drop, how are people able to get it? Is it going to be on Amazon? Yeah, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, a pretty wide distribution. And there's more information at my website just for the book called surfingthecosmos.com. You can find a lot of information there. And uh, thanks for your patience and for listening. Adios. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. It's seven o'clock. Uh, do we have time for more, Colin? Or do you... uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we started at five uh, at um, 5.35, so we can go to uh, 7.05, I guess, for the recording. Lee, did you have a, a question for Michael or? Uh... Uh, Mike, my question was going to be really about 
do they think that there's been any improvement in the acceptance of this kind of approach to artwork within the fine art community world? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I think I, I, my feeling is that there's still uh, a lot of trepidation from very traditional people right now. Yeah. Uh, although I, I, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, the text expressionist uh, group will, will help to make some headway that way, but I don't know. Yeah. People, people still have a, a misconception of, uh, what, what technology, um, and I, and I think the recent, uh, AI phenomenon and also NFTs have just completely blurred um, some of those boundaries as well. So I don't know how it's all going to shake out, to be honest with you. But yeah, I, I I think for those people who who are traditional in some way, they probably look at digital stuff as scans. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to chime in. Um, you know, my feeling is, uh, you know the nft phenomenon and what's been happening lately with ai art and, and just in the last couple of years really i think mostly fueled by nfts and the ability for um, people to monetize their work in that way it's sort of created you know a, an alternative art world where you jump on twitter and there's literally thousands of people every day posting their work publishing their work, minting work, talking about it. It might not be the same art world as the art world, you know, in the meatpacking district or in Chelsea or anywhere else, but it's it's an alt art world. I don't really know how else to describe it. And it's bleeding over into traditional spaces, you know, slowly but surely. So um, I feel fairly optimistic that even though, you know, it's not going to replace what's come before, it's you know, it's displacing it, I, I think, in, in some ways. And it's interesting to see, you know, and it's, I think it's very interesting to see the, the sort of intersection of those spaces, um, you know. And Michael, I really appreciate, you know, you coming on and um, Cynthia also taking the initiative to um, come up with this topic and, and moderate. And uh, we are kind of getting close to the end of this recording session, um, but I would like to, you know, invite you all to stick around after we stop the recording and hopefully see if we can um, cajole uh, another victim to be a moderator and, and come up with a topic for two weeks from now. Um, because I think having the idea of guest moderators really like encourages sort of like a culture of um, sort of curatorial, you know, uh, inclusivity and also the ability for people to develop ideas, you know, in an online medium, which I think, you know, is different than just talking about digital, but like, you know, if we can look at what we're doing here as a group, um, as a social sculpture, in a way that um, you know, it's a creative process that we could all be involved in. Um, that to me would be, you know, uh, sort of the way I would envision um, this project sort of moving forward in in the best possible way. So I'm going to hand it over to Cynthia, though, if you have any closing remarks to wrap up for today. I just want to say I've uh, very much enjoyed listening to our speakers and, and the discussion that we had. Um, it is a challenging subject. And I think uh, even though it is challenging, many artists have taken on different subjects for their work, different concepts, different themes. And not everyone understands those themes, whether it be physics or whether it be, um, you know, automated digital art or AI or, um, you know, just a theme regarding some period in history. And so it's up to the viewer to make decisions about that work and to also do the work to understand. If you're really interested in that art, then you will do the work to perhaps understand. And uh, as a lay person, I've read a number of books on physics that make it somewhat understandable for me, even though there are these mysteries. So there is hope for those who have not studied physics uh, to, to gain some understanding. 
So with that, I, I'll end and thank everyone for coming and Colin for you know making this happen. Uh, you're welcome. And thank you all for attending. Thanks to uh, the presenters. Um, and uh, you know, been been a great salon. Um, one last thought. Um, so tonight um, is going to be uh, the proposed time and date, or overnight, early in the morning hours for the Ethereum merge, which um, might not mean a whole lot to people outside of the NFT space. But I was thinking about it today, and if you know it actually works in the way that people are hoping it works and reduces you know the energy footprint the carbon footprint essentially of ethereum which at least 90 percent of the world's nfts are minted on right now it's going to also have a giant global impact on the carbon footprint that you know artists internet users cryptocurrency you know that that we use um it's essentially like one of the most green things that could have possibly happened in an instant of time that no legislation could accomplish when you really think about it. You know, I mean, if the entire blockchain ecosystem is going to be using 90 some odd percent less energy to operate, that's including all transactions, you know, in, in terms of Ethereum which Bitcoin notwithstanding is going to remain a proof of work um, blockchain. Um, but I think it's pretty good news for artists um, personally. And um, I'm crossing my fingers that I see some, some good headlines for tomorrow. So um, with that, I am going to stop our recording. And anyone who wants to hang out for the um, advisory board session <laughs> is more than welcome to do so. And we will stop in three, two, one, contact.